Abraham Lincoln was so humble, he never responded to all the attacks on him. And yet Donald Trump will call Rosie O'Donnell a fat pig and a fat slob. And we will continue to say, I want to be just like him. How do we have a man who treats women like that? And we don't say to him, look, we, we respect your professional achievements, but to call a woman a fat slob to make fun of her body? And then we wonder why 8% of American girls have eating disorders? They hear this stuff from men all the time. Look at the way the word bitch has become ubiquitous in American college campuses. You hear it all the time. You hear bitch has become the new N-word. No one has any problem saying it. A girl that won't go to bed with you is a bitch. Fat bitch. Because she's fat, she's a bitch? What, what's the connection? How is that a moral, if she's a mean, mean person? Okay, even then you probably shouldn't use it. But because she's overweight? Men do this all the time. There's no code of male honor. And then we wonder why the most successful television show over the past decade is Sex and the City, which really is about four women who've given up on men. Do you think, really, most American men want to be Donald Trump? Well, I can't, I, I, since I don't know the heart of most American men, and since I come from a religion that says action is the most important thing, I can only judge them by their actions. Who's the biggest selling business author in the country? Donald Trump. Who had 12, 13 million people watching his show, The Apprentice? Donald Trump. Who gets more ink than any other businessman in this country? Donald Trump. Yeah, I think they want to be Donald Trump. Um, they may not want to be completely like him. Yeah, I think basically, in other words, if you don't mind me rephrasing your question, do I believe that he has become a role model to many American men? Absolutely. A couple other topics. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I negate the good he does. You know, he wrote me a letter saying that he really thinks I'm unfair to him, and that could be. And I wrote it back a very polite letter, and I said, fine, then, you know, I know you're a good father. He seems to be a very involved father. I believe you probably give charity, although we don't seem to hear a lot about that, but maybe he does it anonymously. But Which would be an attribute. Definitely, definitely. Well, one of the few things he might do anonymously. Yeah, yeah. Although, since it doesn't seem to be in his character, you know, but I, I could be wrong. Let's not judge a man when I don't know him. It's not Donald Trump who I'm criticizing. It's the image of Donald Trump that I'm criticizing. Look, I don't want to sound judgmental, but... You don't think there's a little bit of a Donald Trump in me, maybe not in making money, unfortunately I don't have any of that, but you don't think there's a little bit of me who also, I'm 41, you look at a young woman 20 and you say, ah, oh, she's so pretty. It's just that before I go down the line of thinking that my wife isn't equally pretty, the woman who has stood by me for 20 years, that because she may have one line now, as both of us enter our 40s, that it's time to maybe move on. Can we stop that? Is there nothing inside us men that wants to reward a woman and see her beauty because of her devotion, because of her fidelity, because of she's the mother of our kids? Is every guy in this country who makes a couple of bucks going to dump his wife and move to something younger? Are we never going to finally say this is wrong? Have we lost the ability to simply call something like that wrong? Because what woman would be dumb enough to make that kind of commitment to a man when it's no longer revered? when it's no longer appreciated. Jack Welch is a great businessman. He built up GE to the most powerful, you know, most important, arguably, American corporation. And yet he had like, at least according to the press reports, and they could be inaccurate, he had a single interview with, what's her name, his new wife? Uh, so she was the editor of the Harvard Business Review, right? After one interview, you know, they start going out, you're a married man. There has to be this thing of honor. We all fight it. Men are not naturally monogamous, we know all that. If I'm faithful to my wife, it's not only because I'm a married man and because I'm a husband and because I believe in God and I'm a rabbi, it's because I have a vision of who I want to be. I don't want to be a scumbag, I just don't. I, it, it wouldn't suit, sit well with me. The joy, the pleasure of a sinful affair would never be worth the, the agony of knowing that I have become my worst nightmare. There has to be, we have to restore to our culture a sense of male honor. The honorable male. I, I like that. I appreciate that. It doesn't mean that the Bill Clintons in this world are failures. It means they're failures if they don't fight their nature. All I need to know is that he fights himself to be faithful to his wife. That's all I need to know. Even if he fails sometimes. I need to know that he knows it's wrong, he tells himself, himself it's wrong, and he says to himself, 
I know I'm better than this. On, uh, on page 140, you write something. The quote is, parents don't appreciate kids the way parents once did. We have tiny little families, so kids can't drain our financial resources. Especially the first line. It seems to me it's just basically a bold pronouncement. And I got to say that I'm not quite sure where it comes from, and it's not part of the reality that I know that hopefully I'm experiencing in my house. And aside from the fact that most of my best friends are single in their 40s, which is a whole other issue, um, the guys I know who are married and have families, it, it's, you know, it's about getting a home so that they can jump right in. So is, is that statement from all the stories that you've heard through the years, both on the radio and columns and so on, or is it just kind of a, a sense that you have? Okay. First of all, without sounding patronizing, I can see you're a very good interviewer because you honed in on all of the aspects of the book that really should be challenged based on the fact that they really also try to challenge the mores of a secular culture. Um, meaning, in a secular culture, you have, you know, two kids and three cats. And, um, and no one has big families today, even though we, we can afford them. Um, because we want to spend our money on things that might bring us more joy. When I have eight kids, thank God, we're expecting our ninth in two weeks. Whenever I say this, people look at me like, you poor thing. You know, why'd you do this to yourself? And my wife, whoa, she's even worse off. You poor thing. So when people say to me, why do you have so many kids? I always say, I don't know, it's just logical. They say, logical, it's crazy. Why is it logical? I said, look, all of us pursue things in life that give us pleasure and joy, right? They say, right? I said, so for example, if I love traveling, I won't travel to one place, like Hoboken, New Jersey, every week. I will try to spread it out. I'll try to go to Rome, Paris. Makes sense? It makes sense. So many destinations. Same thing is true if I love stamps. I'll collect many stamps, not one. Yeah, great. If I love cars, I'll have a whole collection of cars, right? Right. So then I say to them, well, logically speaking, there's many things that I love in this world, but really, I don't love anything more than my kids, so I decided to have a lot of that. I don't, that is perfectly logical. If you love kids more than anything, you're going to have a lot of kids. If you love your money in the bank, you're going to have, you know, a lot of that. Um, I know it's not a completely sound argument, because there are some counter-arguments. People say, if you have too many kids, you can't give them all attention and all that. I don't believe that to be true. But be that as it may, I love my children. I love being a father. It's what I love most in the whole world. I love seeing them grow up. I love instilling values within them. I even love when they're like tough and they rebel a little bit. I love seeing them show some oomph and character. So why is it that we have such tiny families and it's becoming a crisis? First of all, the white population in America is slowly going to disappear. Not that I really care because whiteness is utterly immaterial. It means nothing. But insofar as it is an indicator that the white people are the wealthiest in this country and they have the fewest children, black families are bigger, Latino families are bigger, minority families are bigger, the white population is not replenishing its numbers right now. That's why we're seeing, even in presidential demographics, that the black community and the Latino community is growing. By the way, the Jewish community, we're shrinking. Because we're white, and we're a bit more financially well off, and we don't appreciate kids anymore. The great challenge to the continuity of American Jewry is no longer intermarriage, it's the low birth rate. The Jewish, the death rate is, I think, 2.3 per family. We're having uh, 1.7 per family. I love when statisticians give these numbers. You ever see someone who had like one, a 0.7 of a child? But, so the white population is disappearing in America. Our demographics are, are smaller and smaller. By the way, here's another interesting thing. According to the magazine The Week, the reason why there's this, been this great rise of conservative politics in America um, is not only because of born-again Christians, it's because liberals have fewer children, far fewer children, and they marry much later. Now that's not to say one group is right and one group is wrong. It is to look at where our values are placed. It's just, it's a birth rate thing. It's incredible when you think about that. That the Republican Party has grown specifically because their constituents have a larger birth rate, which they do. Be that as it may. I saw another article in the week which was fascinating that said that a third child in America is becoming a great statement of affluence. Because the article estimated that from birth to uh, being grown up, it costs parents $250,000 to raise a child. So if you can afford it, that's a lot of money. Now the fact is, no children go completely hungry in America. I know we have issues of poverty. We have to, of course, deal with them and not pretend they don't exist. But thank God, by and large, people don't starve to death in our country. We can, we can afford it. We just don't want it. So I need to conclude based on all that, but um, why are we doing this? 